with um, taking some of Vanya's ideas further later on in our conversation, I would like to move on to introduce Chao Kai Fei, who is a Berlin-based Singaporean artist, a multidisciplinary artist, whose practices uh, have evolved from the time I worked with him in Hakawe in, in, in the early part of his career as Kill Your Television, to now he situates himself in the intersection of dance, media, art and performance. He's a graduate of the MA in Design Interaction from the Royal College of Art and um, was on the DAAD in Berlin, where he has stayed on, as many other artists have, for the last eight years. So I hand over the floor to you now, Kafai. Thank you very much. Hello. Thank you. Thank you, Shaheen. Um, thank you for inviting me. And uh, um, my, my lecture today is actually titled, uh, we should put on the slide, actually. It's a slide on full screen, sorry. Yeah, can we put on the first, my PowerPoint, please? Great. Yes, so uh, the, the, what I'm going to share with you today, um, it's titled Telepresence in the Age of the Extreme Self. And I will share with you one of my experiments in creating a remote telepresence studio for my performance post-colonial spirit, and my research in the notion of extreme self, which in my own understanding is redefining uh, us today within the accelerated human culture. As an artist, I'm interested in the human condition. And for me, dance is a way or one of the most fascinating way to study human culture. And what I mean by telepresence refers to a set of technologies which allows a person to feel as if they were present to give the appearance or effect of being present at a place other than their true location. This concept was first uh, appears in the science fiction novel in 1942. And for me, the first artistic project that engages in telepresence is that of South Korean artist, the father of video art, Park Nam Jun. He, together with a collective of artists, including choreographer Merce Cunningham and artist Joseph Boy, they make the first international satellite installation called Good Morning, Mr. Orwell on the New Year Eve, New Year Day of 1984. The event was broadcast live in New York, the Centre Pompidou in Paris, and also in main TV station in the United States, Germany, South Korea, and reach an estimated audience of over 25 million viewers worldwide. Wikipedia knows that citation is needed, so nobody can verify the numbers of audience. The extreme self for me is really about the near future, and I've been exploring the notion of self in my work, the physical self, the digital self, and the conceptual self. In our capitalist world today, there is a constant overconsumption and overproduction of almost everything. I feel that the individual begins to depart from the traditional culture of a community. The self becomes isolated. However, the constant rise of Western individualism would eventually return the self to seek for itself. Thus, we see a rise of New Age spiritual uh, community, endless yoga retreat, and new communities set out for common belief, all seeking spirituality away from the traditional realm of religion. The self then began a journey of constant optimization to replace itself with a better version of itself, updating with new sensibility from the physical self to the digital self, and now to the extreme self within the metaverse. Here you see an image of a Dolalak folk dancer from Indonesia. Uh, and in my recent performance, Postcolonial Spirit, which is uh, a telepresence performance inspired by the Indonesian folk dance of Dolalak. The trance dance ritual from 1930 
draws upon a multidimensional history of traditional Javanese dance movement, imitation of partying colonial Dutch soldier, and melodic Islamic poems. Dolalak dance heritage opens up a liminal space in which dance transcends beyond the resistance of coloniality, power, and fantasy. Here is a dance ritual that I filmed in 2020. So next slide, please. So colonial photography is actually one of my main entry point for the creation of post-colonial spirit. As a contemporary artwork, it is inspired by the colonial photography of Woodsbury and Page, who set up a photo studio business in Jakarta during the 1960s. The studio create topographical surveys of indigenous culture, and they sold images of Java, temples, and landscape. But their main commission was taking portraits of high-ranking Dutch army officers and members of the Javanese aristocracy. Next. Um, I found this fascinating photo where Javanese king would cosplay as a general of a royal Dutch in the army, and Europeans would dress up as American cowboy, Japanese or Arabs, tribesmen. Here you see, uh, uh, can we go back the slide? Here you see the Javanese king dressed as a Dutch is in the officer. And on the right is actually his Andy Warhol moment where he duplicate 12 uh, different self of himself wearing different costume. I mean, it's, it's literally cosplaying for me at that time. For me, this image like the 18th century Instagram and the difference at the time is this is only for the powerful, but now to today's context, it is for anyone who has a social media account. I speculate that this first cosplay culture, high society dignitary would be the very beginning of Dola, which is officially documented from 1930, where indigenous people dress up as colonial Dutch soldier, drinking and partying as part of a Javanese trance dance ritual. The sheer amazement of seeing these images inspired me to investigate more the historical lineage of Javanese dance and trance as a form of resistance. For me, the origins of Dolalak manifest as the desire of ordinary people who wants to become royalties or noblemen. Maybe this act of role playing serves as pure entertainment or freedom of expression by the ruling class. Perhaps they hint at a form of political banter or mockery of their own indigenous king who wanted to look like white colonial. Leader. Next slide, please. I also found many other uh, photos. This one, um, some are very clear, queer, uh, where Dutch soldiers would cosplay a pregnant woman or Indonesian lady. And from my research, there is a lot of costume party, ballroom event as well at that time. Of course, there's huge imbalance of Dutch female to the Dutch male population in Indonesia at that time. The Dutch colonized Java since 1576, and at the end of the 18th century, there seems to be a proliferation of new Javanese trans ritual. Each region have mutated traditional Javanese dance into their own version. 
the movement started as a pure form of expression, dialogue and drama that infuses folk tales with current affairs. It seeks to rebel against their phantom Javanese ruler who submit to the powerful economics of the Dutch East India Company. The evolution of Java trans dance ritual seems to allow the rise of Western individualism and capitalism. The bourgeoisie bodies and the radical self birth to new gurus and cults that counter the historic superpower of traditional religion. The idea of self today is more important than ever. The self needs coaching, needs healing, and needs to be expanded. Next. And play the video. The witch dances alone. A figure both frightening and representative of fear itself. It's simply quite amazing to observe the liminal New Age movement and consider the Indonesian trajectory of trans culture. When what you just saw is a 1930 ethnographic film of a Javanese trans dance to that of what I filmed in 2020, maybe nothing much has changed choreographically. Next. The witch dance. In slow motion again, you see the look of contorted, beaming agony on the face of this trans. So while comparing these two footages, it seems to me that its primary function of the ritual binding the hearts and spirits of people are still intact. But perhaps this reflects still on the social economic relationship that many Javanese or Indonesian working today continue to be marginalized or exploited by the current ruling class or multinational companies in the post-colonial time. Next. Here you see a TikTok account of Dewi Aru, which is a group of young girls coming from the tradition of Dolala. They have taken on the social media as their digital platform for expression. As you can see, they have 1.6 million followers. Um, I think as an artist myself, I would never influence 1.6 million people in my lifetime. But these are just teenage girls who are just as young as 12 years old, or maybe more as 16 or 17. And they are just dancing on TikTok. Maybe I should really consider starting a TikTok account myself and start cosplaying a little bit. I want to show you the showreel uh, uh, TikTok account. Can you play the next video? So apart from forming on in virtuality in the Instagram account, um, they also perform in real life, which uh, attracts very, very young audience. Can we put the next video, please? So it seems to me that in Indonesia, there was never a break from traditional practice. That it is an unbroken chain adaptation that continuously intertwines and lay upon current modes of experience and traditional form. Um, you can see from the tradition of folk dance, from the village to the social media, and now onto the metaverse. Although century has passed, this post-colonial fingers in the dance Javanese. This choreographic tradition transcends into the, the virtual. It multi as a console of ordinary people, and it plays the roles of spiritual guidance to that of entertainment, pop culture, and TikTok celebrity worship. However, one of its functions has been as a critical voice 
people against the power. This is the backdrop or concept framework for me to create the telepresence of post-colonial Next. So while the first thing uh, in the process was to envision a telepresence studio, and what I mean by that is a real-time motion capture studio, which digitally transmit the dance from Indonesia to anywhere else in the world. Next, see an image of the telepresence studio in Asia. And uh, to quickly explain that the dance is fitted with a motion capture device and we digitize his dance via an independent server and we live stream his movement data onto the stage to Berlin for the premiere of this performance. His dance expression actually digitized and compressed into a stream of data and teleported via the internet. And when it reached me in Berlin, it was expanded onto a virtual dancing avatar in, to represent his presence. Next. So on in Berlin, we have, uh, I invited a Dutch dance artist, Vincent Rivik, to make this sort of possible duet with uh, the folk dancer Andre from Indonesia. And the concept was to invite a Dutch person to relearn or to Dolala, which was originally inspired by Dutch colonial soldier drinking and partying in Indonesia. For me, it's kind of a conceptual loop to transmit Dolalak dance into the Dutch body. In a way, it returns the resonance to the Dutch. And next, just a little bit of a personal history with Vincent Rip. Um, he has a personal connection to Indonesia. His mother was born in Sumatra. Grandparents met and got married in Indonesia. His grandmother worked at Red Cross uh, as a nurse at the Red Cross, and his grandfather worked as an agricultural specialist in the plantation in Sumatra. So for him coming to this project uh, has a special connection to him, which like the Dutch family, it's commonly connected somehow in one way or another with the Indonesian. Next. Um, the concept of telepresence in my work manifests in three different years. First, the presence of the folk dance transmitted digitally into the virtual realm. Number two, a parallel concept when a dancer go into trance, it means that a spirit or a being, a spiritual being enters the body. If you look at it in this manner, the presence of the spirit can be transnational and literally as a stream of data. Number three, the presence of both the spirit and the dancer forms a kind of supernatural union with Dutch dancer in this impossible duet. And what I mean by the impossible duet is, uh, if you could play the next video, please. So here is a process of uh, learning uh, folk dance uh, entirely over a period of six months prior to the peak of the performance. And it's where Vincent has, has totally zero knowledge of the dance form. And for almost two years, they, they began dancing together virtually. And it's, it's really quite impossible to learn an intricate uh, multi-dimensional dance form just via uh, Zoom without touching the body. So we have come to terms about transmitting the presence of Dorala rather than the dance notation itself. And uh, let me show you uh, a three-step process on stage where uh, the first thing we do was to do a video live streaming to let them dance in a 2D manner. Can you play the piece?
then it trans uh, transit into a 3D form. Where it dis the appearance of the body disappear and replaced by a digital avatar. Play video, please. So I don't know if you realize the, the songs they sing are actually from ancient Java language, but we sort of translated them into English. And some of them doesn't make sense because in Bahasa Indonesia uh, language, sometimes they don't use grammar, but also all this, uh, it's, it's fun in a way how, uh, what are they singing about? If we didn't make this step, you would think that it's some sacred and holy song because it's something that you don't understand or when a performer put on a costume, I always feel that people think that it's a traditional dance form. But in fact, uh, it is contemporary in a way. Until this stage, we try to recreate uh, from the original notation from the 1930s. And then uh, next. But of course, when we uh, move into the virtual realm, uh, there will be endless possibility. And for me, the narrative always drives the creative expression and how we use technology. In the context of uh, theatricality, I believe that sometimes you need to forget what is real, what is virtual, and what is hyper-real. What is most important for the artistic expression and what can be magical. So I believe that uh, contemporary art should still be about enchantment uh, beyond the burden of concept, criticality, and this. I'd like to play you a clip from the ending scene of the performance. Next, I would actually like to play you a five minute uh, behind scene video uh, filmed from the telepresence studio in Indonesia during uh, the week of our premiere performance. And it's from the perspective of my Indonesian collaborator and in their own language, Bahasa Indonesia, which I feel is really important when I talk about this work for their voice to be heard. Di project ini sebenarnya aku uh, beberapa peran uh, ya lebih mudahnya koordinator produksi lah ya di sini gitu. Terus selain itu aku juga membantu Kafai untuk uh, riset dia selama di Indonesia itu tahun 2019 akhir. Dan juga tantangan paling penting adalah karena ini musim pandemi karya karyanya tuh terkait dengan teknologi jadi tantangan banget buat aku. Uh, sebenarnya awalnya saya tidak menduga sama sekali ya. 
uh, memang dulu Kalfai pada tahun 2019 itu pernah datang ke grup Nolalak Budi Santoso itu grup uh, yang saya ikuti di, di desa nah itu dia datang untuk untuk uh, menyaksikan pertunjukan kami dan dia mewawancari beberapa penari juga sih uh, nah uh, Kalfai mempunyai proyek yang juga mengangkat Nolalak begitu dan Alhamdulillah dan kebetulan saya yang menjadi penarinya gitu awal mulanya seperti itu Uh, aku itu kalau maunya musik gitu, kalau maunya mikirnya tentang musik, apalagi pertunjukan ini tentang dolala gitu. Aku menolak kalau playback, uh, ada musisi live di sana. Karena kalau nggak ada musisi live, ini nggak akan ngangkat. Maksudnya musiknya nggak akan ngangkat, nggak iya nggak akan jadi satu dengan pertunjukannya. Karena ada ada kesulitan teknis ya. Karena kalau mengirim file, eh, mengirim suara dari sini ke sana akan delay dan itu akan akan merusak tatanan pertunjukan. Jadi aku putuskan, oke, okay, boleh playback tapi dari sana. Jadi semuanya yang di playback ini, semuanya file yang ada di sini, semua sebenarnya sudah diatur di sana. Di playback. Tapi tetap harus ada yang live. Dan aku posisinya ini juga live sebenarnya, tapi hanya untuk Andri. Karena bagaimanapun dia, dia penari dolala kan, harus ada, harus ada uh, sesuatu yang apa ya bersama-sama main itu loh. Eh, kalau di seni tradisi kan, kalau nari sendiri itu ya aneh. Uh, ternyata saya juga selain diminta nari dolala, juga disuruh nari kontemporer seperti balet. Gitu. Nah, itu juga merupakan hal yang baru pertama kali saya lakukan, yang per baru pertama kali saya pelajari untuk nari kontemporer. Dan itu merupakan uh, kesempatan saya untuk belajar dan juga saya bisa mengenal budaya mereka. gitu loh. Itu memang tantangan. Karena tadi aku bilang, ini di tengah pandemi, Um, di mana tatap muka itu sulit sekali, jadi koordinasi uh, untuk tatap muka itu yang paling sulit. Dan sejak awal memang uh, produksi ini dilakukan secara uh, online ya, live, live, bukan live streaming tapi online dengan platform Zoom gitu. Kami latihan uh, hampir 10 hari setiap bulan selama tiga bulan itu uh, selalu dengan Zoom. Jadi ada apa ya uh, realita bahwa kita tidak uh, bisa memungkiri fakta kita semua saat ini terhubung uh, di saat yang bersamaan gitu D dengan konteks waktu yang berbeda dan tempat yang berbeda uh, Kafai juga sudah ber bermain lama dengan motion capture sama saya udah lima tahun yang lalu terus uh, dia sudah bekerja dengan berba ber ber apa, berbagai eksperimental yang juga melibatkan teknologi, brain wave sensor dan uh, setelah dicari-cari kemudian ternyata eksekusi menggunakan animasi avatar hanya itu yang bisa mempertemukan atau merepresent merepresentasikan um, apa, visualisasi dari spirit Ya jujur ini juga saya belum terbayang dari awal project bahwa saya akan mengenangkan motion alat seperti ini Uh, saya nyebutnya ini robot ya, <laughs> karena tubuh saya ditempel beberapa alat, apa ini kabel-kabel gitu. Ini merupakan ya, itu pertama kali juga memakai air seperti ini dan sedikit ngumun ya. Wah, kok keren teman gitu, kok canggih gitu. Cuma ditempelin saya gerak kok di komputer ikut gerak gitu animasinya itu juga uh, amaze banget sih pertamanya. Buatku tantangannya ya itu, mengkoordinasi uh, produksi secara online. Itu banyak sekali tantangannya. Itu sih, kalau diceritakan satu-satu, itu tadi. Selain bahasa, juga perkara kita bagaimana menguasai teknologi untuk memfasilitasi pekerjaan kita. We will fade up your image and the screen will go up. So you dance in the space, yeah, until the first stop of the music, ya. Yeah? We try this now, all the time, from the beginning. Ini pertunjukan khususnya tari, biasanya <coughs> lekat dengan tatap muka. Live gitu, langsung kita terikat emosi yang cukup cukup ini ya cukup kuat dengan penonton tapi kemudian kita di situasi pandemi ini kita difasilitasi dengan teknologi kita harus mengakrabkan diri dengan teknologi gitu kita harus hadapi supaya bisa survive untuk kedepannya bisa tetap jalan gitu seni pertunjukan seni tari yang sekarang produksi sedang berjalan karena komunikasi dengan baik itu tadi dari tim kerjanya Mas Ananta jadi uh, semua teratasi dengan baik buktinya kemarin Uh, tiga kali pentas, well done gitu, uh, big applause, full house juga. Action!
Ay, que no se olvide. Yo leí. Yeah, next slide, please. Yeah, maybe some of you didn't expect to be there's a sequence to this work. Uh, so after two years of making this Sally Presence performance, almost uh, they are like almost tragic lovers in a long distance relationship. Uh, the whole team, uh, the Indonesian one and the European one, never met in real life. So finally, the two group of artists met uh, last September 2022 in Java, in Indonesia, and we have the chance to make a new adaptation without the telepresence on stage at the world's largest Buddhist monument, the Boroboro Boro Temple. So I want to show you a clip, a short reel of that performance. So for the first time in my life, I felt like a rock star. I invited uh, the TikTok Dolalak girls to perform with us. And it was so surreal to dance with them and all the audience would dance with us because everyone would gyrate to the Indonesian pop tunes of Dangdu. From the intellect, the grandfather, the festival crew to the bus driver, basically everyone would dance with us at the end of the performance. So for me, this is a special performance or a gathering to celebrate the heritage of Dolalak. And it may serve uh, as still the, the basic function uh, of a ritual in binding the hearts and mind of people. I was very happy to be able to perform with or without technology, with and without telepresence. Next. Uh, so to conclude my, my talk, uh, for me, looking at this Dewi Arum girls, um, it made me rethink about the notion of our extreme self in the age of accelerated digital culture and lifestyle. It seems to me that there is a emergence of ritual, a reappearance of ritual that is also possible online. The compulsion to consume emotion within the erratic stream uh, of data becomes so fluid, almost like a second nature with a swipe of your finger, with a twitch of uh, your index finger, multiple screen of floating windows appears in front of you. The influencer today becomes the digital gods that channels, follows, likes, and view. The numbers are translated into capital in real life. In return, the influencer would provide a dance, a laughter, a smile, or a wink, and some skin maybe. And she entertained nonstop from a few seconds to hundreds of hours. The mundane life of the ordinary becomes an eternal moving selfie to share intimately online to anyone and anywhere. Today, the influencer function as a tradition the role of a traditional pastor or shaman that serves congregation of thousands and most of the, the time without a need for spiritual calling, moral. The medicine is just pop culture and junk food media. Uh, I quote uh, Bu Chun Han writes about time online lacking a solid structure, which doesn't provide any hole from, for any community to, to be housed, I would suggest that that is from the perspective from outside of the, uni, uh, the multiverse. For those inside, the erratic stream and point-like presence provides a virtual structure to rehouse a community who donate or invest time and provide the free flow of capital. Next. So at the end, uh, I question, is this then the ultimate reflex of human solitude? The reality of our digital self becoming 
the extreme self that blurs into a crescendos of emoji. Thank you.